Station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. Fernback Science Center. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Doug Rabby at Fernbank Science Center. How do you hear me? Hello, Doug, and hello, everyone, at the Fernbank Science Center. We read you loud and clear. Welcome on board the International Space Station with Expedition 35. Harris, and I'm from MLK High School, and this question is for Chris Hatfield. I was wondering, are you used to being weightless every day? Hello, am I used to being weightless every day? You wouldn't believe how used I am to being weightless. It is a great, fun thing to be weightless. You can, you can go any way you like. You can be upside down or right side up. It's so nice. You never even have to hold your head up. Living in weightlessness is, is so much fun. There's no up or down, and I'm completely used to it. It's going to feel weird to go back to Earth now. Hello, my name is Brandon Odell. I'm from Arabia Mountain High School, and this question is directed to Tom. What do you have to do if you succumb to illness or infection? Do you have to leave the space station? That's a great question, something we think about a lot. Uh, you don't have to leave the space station, at least not right away by any means. We've got actually just under our feet right here under the floor is our mini hospital. It's got a lot of equipment. We can take care of all minor problems. Uh, we can take care of a person for about a day for a serious medical problem. But if it got too serious, then we'd have to get in our Soyuz. It's kind of like our ambulance. Here's a, one of the medical kits. We've got a bunch of these that look just like this. And our crewmate, uh, Chris Cassidy, is opening it up to kind of show you. It's got everything laid out in there. Whole bunch of kits like this, uh, full of medications and anything we might need. Plus doctors on the ground to talk to and specialists on the ground if we had to. Uh, we could even bring them on board with video to help us out with a medical problem. But if it got bad enough, yeah, we'd have to get in our spaceship, our Soyuz, and come back to Earth. Um, after warm greetings, um, my name is Firdaus Abdul, and I go to Tucker High School. Um, I have a question for Mr. Chris Cassidy. <clears throat> what would you do if you saw something out of the ordinary in space, such as signs of life? Ah, very interesting question. Well, fortunately for us so far, the only uh, strange forms of life we see are each other at <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning when we wake up out of our crew quarters. Uh, but, um, you know, we, that's not something we plan for every day. If, if, and um, we would communicate with Mission Control and, and uh, just make sure that everything was normal up here on the space station. I'm Govinda Harris from Arabia Mountain High School, and my question is for Chris. How do you recycle the oxygen you breathe? Specifically, are there plants or machines that convert carbon dioxide to oxygen, or do you get shipments of oxygen? Yeah, that's, that's a cool question because it's a problem we have to solve. We live sort of inside an aluminum bubble up here. And then the outside of our spaceship is an empty vacuum, just nothing. So all of our oxygen and everything's inside. So when we breathe out with carbon dioxide, where does it go? And on Earth, plants and grass and everything turn, soak up the carbon dioxide. Here, we have uh, machines that do it for us, that purify, that remove the carbon dioxide. Um, when we go to the bathroom, the liquid that comes out of us, some of it we actually uh, put electricity into so that the oxygen is recovered from that. And then also when resupply ships come up, they bring oxygen to us. So the answer to your question is sort of all three. But we don't have any plants on board that are just for purifying our air. 
Um, not yet. We've had a few plants on board, but so far it's not an efficient way when you have something as critical as a spaceship for us to, uh, to count on to purify our atmosphere. Hi, my name is Mikaelson Layson, and I attend Miller Grove High School. This question is for Tom. How long are you away from your family, and how often do you get the opportunity to speak with them? Well, I've been away from my family now for four months. Typically, uh, crews come up here to the space station for six months. And but you know what? Uh, two and a half years b when before we fly in space, that's when we start training, and we travel all around the world to many different countries to do our training. So we're away from our families then as well. So uh, that's probably one of the hardest things about flying in space. One of these days, I'm hoping we'll get to where we can uh, bring our families up with us and uh, have the whole go on a family trip up into space. That'd be a wonderful goal to achieve. Uh, I can talk to my family. We have a, uh, I can use my laptop to talk to my family at their home phone, uh, bouncing the signal off a lot of satellites. And we have email. It's not quite as efficient as uh, the email you might use at home, but it's really, really good, and it's a wonderful way to stay in contact with our families. Hi, my name is Morgan Rossi. I go to Druid Hills High School. This question is for Chris Cassidy. How did your personal priorities change once you were in space? What did you realize was most important to you? Morgan, that's a really interesting question. And um, there's probably two ways to answer it. One is on a more small scale, day-to-day -day type thing. And my priorities are to complete the jobs that Mission Control has laid out for us that day uh, as efficiently and uh, correctly as I can without making any mistakes and, uh, and helping out my crewmates. There's a, a saying that we have that there's no greater, no more important thing than what you're doing right then because on a space station, you can uh, take an action that can cause problems to equipment or yourself. So on a, on a small scale, my priorities are just working correctly and well. Um, on a bigger scale, more broader scale, looking down at the planet is something that's really just amazing. Looking at the blues and the browns and the whites uh, of uh, all the different majestic colors, and it really makes you think that's our wonderful home, our planet, and we need to take care of it as a, as a mankind. And that's sort of the broader scale perspective that being here is giving me. Um, hi, my name is J.L. Stanton. I go to Arabia Mountain High School. And this question is for Chris Hadfield. How long do you think it will be until regular people get to go up to space or live in space on a regular basis? Well, two things. Number one, we're just regular people. It's not like we were born as astronauts or something. We, we all went to middle school and high school, and I decided to be an astronaut when I was nine years old. And I started turning myself into an astronaut when I was nine. So it's not like... We're not regular people. This is just what we chose to do. But as far as just being able to maybe just buy a ticket and go, f go fly in space, it's sort of like how flying was early on. Regular people couldn't just go for a flight in an airplane. And it really wasn't until after two world wars that there was a huge amount of uh, research done on making airplanes faster and safer and more efficient. It wasn't really until the 50s that just regular people could buy airline tickets and go flying. And we're sort of in the early stages of space flight, way, way back in like 1910 or 1915 of aviation, where it's possible, but it's still really hard and dangerous. And we still need to invent a lot of things before anybody can just buy a ticket and go. But that's where we're headed. And there's some companies just starting to do that now. And hopefully by the time you're our age, uh, you could be an astronaut if you want. Or maybe you may be able to just buy a ticket and, and go visit the moon. Hi, my name is Aziza Fullerton, and this question is for Tom. Do you feel a difference in your body as you travel through the atmosphere? If so, what or how do you feel and how do you adjust? So uh, traveling through the atmosphere to get up here in space and then arriving in space are two very different stages. You can definitely feel the launch 
uh, when you're sitting in the rocket, all the vibration and the shaking, you can even feel the rocket, uh, its computer searching for that perfect point in orbit that you're going to reach. There's the pressure in your chest when you're in, inside the rocket as it's uh, accelerating through the atmosphere and getting into space. Feels like, a, some of us say it's like a gorilla on your chest. You have to take your breath in little sips. And then when you hit zero gravity, suddenly you're thrown forward in your seat and everything is weightless. It's a very sudden event. After that, the slower changes occur as your body gets used to weightlessness. Uh, I noticed that, first thing you notice is that the blood goes up into your head. You almost feel like you're hanging upside down a little bit. And you might feel a little dizzy in your head just because your sensors that tell you what's up and what's down that are inside your head, they don't know what to do with this information, the lack of, uh, of gravity. They have no idea how to deal with that at first. But then your body adapts to it. And then over time, uh, you can feel all those changes slightly go away, so you don't notice them much anymore. But our bodies are changing still right now while we're here. Our bones and our muscles are wasting a little bit because we're not even, we're not working hard at all. We're not standing and we're not having to do any work just to be here floating in front of you. So we have to exercise to take care of that. But those are some of the changes that we feel when we come up into space. Hi, my name is Victoria Brown and I go to Ravy Mountain High School. Um, this question is for Chris Cassidy. Um, I heard that astronauts lose bone destiny in their arms and stuff. So is this a change that you feel or do you notice it when you come back to Earth? Well, that's interesting because we're studying that very subject right now. Tom just briefly mentioned it a second ago. And uh, what we've learned over time in the recent years is that there are a few critical things we can do to help lessen the impact of the bone density loss. And, that, and the main thing we can do is resistive exercise, lifting weights or putting what we call a load on our bones. And if we do that well and, uh, and the right amount of, re of uh, resistance for our given body, then our goal as each individual astronaut is to have no bone density. Now, that's a hard thing to achieve and when we get back to earth we usually do lose a little bit of bone density i personally haven't i've only, on a shuttle mission i uh, didn't experience much bone density loss because it was such a short mission um, so i'll be very curious to possibly come back to atlanta and answer your question at the end of this six months if i felt the difference between prior to flight and after Hi, my name is Emma Matthews, and this is from Druid Hills High School, and this question is for Chris Hadfield. Do non-human animals also lose bone density in space? Yes, they do. Imagine what it's going to be like for the first human baby that's born in space, because eventually it'll happen. You know, how will it develop as it grows? How will its spine and its bones and everything develop without gravity? And one way to try and understand that is to bring animals that have a very quick life, you know, very simple, small animals. And so we've had several on board, everything from little tiny fishes, you know, right through a bunch of others, to try and understand just that question. What we are finding is, yes, their, their skeletons develop differently. Uh, it's as if you spent your whole life floating in jello. And, and, and saw how your body would react. And so it just develops differently. Your body's the product of what you do to a large degree. So yes, uh, animals have the same problems that we do, and it's sort of the same problem that a lot of older people have on Earth with osteoporosis. So it's an important thing to study. Uh, hello, my name is Zachary Chanel, and I go to Southwest Cat. And this question is for Tom. Is it a problem if you become overweight or underweight for launch or return to Earth? Well, it could be a problem. You know, we work pretty hard on making sure that doesn't happen, that we get enough to eat and that we exercise, we have a good appetite, and uh, the exercise keep, helps keep us from getting overweight as well. But it's important. You want, need to be able to fit in your seat in your spaceship, for one thing, if you launch, you know, we grow a little bit because of weightlessness, and you need to be able to fit in that same seat to go home. So we actually uh, consciously think of that and plan for that. Uh, but it's important to, to, uh, for us to be taking care of ourselves before launch. We want our ejection systems and our training aircraft to work just right. We need to be able to fit in our spacesuits. There's only a few types of spacesuits. There's a few sizes. They're way too expensive to make a custom suit for every astronaut. So we have to be able to fit in those. And so you can't be a little 
too small or uh, too small or too large. But um, a lot of us like to, to exercise. So once we arrive at NASA as astronauts with a certain body type, we're usually able to keep that body type the whole time, including at the time in space. Hi, my name is Amy Fallon, and I go to Chambly Charter High School. This question is for Chris Cassidy. How long does it take to adjust to gravity once you return to Earth? Hi, Amy. Well, as a rough rule of thumb, it takes about as long as you are in space to fully get back to your normal self when you, get, uh, when you return. Uh, when Tom and I were on STS-127 together, um, we were in space for two weeks, much like Chris's earlier shuttle missions. And um, after two weeks, I felt ready to do all the things I did before, go for a run, um, walk, this, have the same endurance, and that, and that type of thing. We're not allowed to drive. Uh, for the first handful of days, and uh, when we come back from a multi-month mission, we're not allowed to drive for about two weeks, and I think that's a great rule because, uh, for instance, when I took my first shower after returning and I had my eyes closed and washing my hair, the whole world started to spin around inside the shower, and I did my best not even tumble at, not to tumble outside of the, uh, the shower curtain. So there's really good rules in place, and uh, it takes us about several months after this mission to get back to normal. Hi, my name is Taylor Wynn, and I'm from Tucker High School. And my question's for Chris Hadfield. What do you do in your free time? Hey, thanks, Carolyn. We, mostly, we look out the window. It, it sounds silly, but it is more beautiful than you can imagine. We, we go around the world every 90 minutes. The world turns underneath us. So every time you come around, it's a new part of the world. You get a sunrise, and then 45 minutes later, you get a sunset. Looking out the window is like, uh, it's almost like, like you're stealing something. It's just so precious, and it's just coming there in front of you. And then also, I like to do other things. I play guitar and sing, so I like playing music up here, and I read a little bit. We talk to each other. But the number one pastime, I think, of all astronauts is looking at the beauty of the world. Hi, my name is Jordan Moore from Miller Grove High School. My question is for Tom. What is a typical day like on the space station? Well, there's uh, probably no such thing as a typical day, but when we all wake up, because every day is so different, we've got so many experiments going on, but when we wake up, usually what we do, we do what you would do at home. We eat breakfast, um, we uh, maybe review some of our, our homework, look over the things we're going to do that day so that we know that we're ready to go. We might read the news. Uh, Mission Control sends us up some information about the day the coming up and our activities that day, so we'll take a look at that as well. And then we'll uh, get all cleaned up and get ready to go to work. We uh, work straight through the day, we take a break for lunch. We like to eat lunch together, so we try to do that together. We do spend two and a half hours a day, each of us, with exercise. Both uh, this, There's a, a cycler ergometer, a stationary bike right here, there's a resistive exercise device uh, behind us and a treadmill as well, so we're exercising a lot. Then we'll have dinner, and then we uh, have a little bit of free time then, and we might, as uh, Chris mentioned, uh, look out the window. Uh, sometimes we are able to watch a little bit of TV, but usually we're doing some homework or making some videos, taking pictures, things that we're going to want to uh, treasure when we get back from our space flight. When, uh, oftentimes we'll call home as well. So that's about as close as I can get to a typical day, I think. But it's always different. It's always fun. Members on the space station, we thank you greatly for your time. I think the students have greatly appreciated being with you today. Uh, we've been informed by, by Houston that we're, we're kind of out of time for this window. Uh, but we want to say thank you for everything that you're doing for uh, the country and, and, and our future out in space. Thank you very much. It was, it was a delight to talk to you today. Thank you so much. And Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fernbank Science Center and students. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure video and audio comms.